This is an update of a talk I put together back in 2017 and I thought I'd dust off and give it again with a small couple of small updates now in May 2020. The talk isn't on the most exciting subject matter for underwater photography but it is a really important one. So if you're just browsing around looking for a talk on underwater photography to see some pretty pictures and hear some fun stories, this probably isn't the talk to start with. But if you're really into your underwater photography and you want to learn something about the important topic of dome port theory, water contact lenses and that sort of thing, this talk hopefully is really, really valuable to you. I've provided the talk in two to make it easier to watch online. Uh, both parts are quite long and got lots of technical information but hopefully it gives you everything you need to know to appreciate underwater optics and especially dome ports and water contact lenses and how they work underwater. Although 2017 is just a couple of years ago, this talk came from the days before Nauticam had made the WACP-1. In fact, the talk was prompted by the work I was doing with Nauticam field testing prototypes that were the ancestors of that lens, which is why I guess we called this talk at the time past, present and future, as I was excited by the direction that we were going. Anyway, since then, the WACP-1 has become a widespread reality and I've shot the imminent WACP-2 and we've seen lots of other water contact optics hit the market. And like all lenses, to be fair, some are excellent and some, well, really aren't. So it seemed like a good time to update this presentation. I should also mention that I've included Edward Lai, the, the founder of Nauticam, as a co-author on the talk. However, this talk is, is very much all my opinion and I certainly don't speak for Edward or Nauticam, but I, I really wanted to credit Edward as a co-author because I'm using some of his images and some really unique data that he collected specifically for this talk. This first part is all about understanding the optical problems of shooting wide angle underwater, which should be valuable both for your normal underwater photography and also for understanding the advantages of water contact optics. I very much see water contact lenses and ports as the next step of evolution beyond dome ports for wide angle photography. These designs have really proliferated since I first made this talk back in 2017. And to be honest, the term water contact has become something of a marketing buzzword, which manufacturers use mainly to try to increase sales rather than having any specific technical definition. It's taken to mean everything from state of the art underwater optical designs to pretty much little more than, yeah, this works in water. So do be aware that the words water contact are not necessarily a guarantee of sort of next generation optical quality. And there's plenty of water contact lenses out there which can easily still be outperformed by a good dome port setup. This talk is really focused on high-end gear and it's really aimed at full-frame photographers, particularly these days where many have invested in really high-quality cameras packed with megapixels. And if you've gone to those lengths, you really want to realise that full potential in the final image, particularly if you're printing your work, whether it's in publications or printing large format prints. These sensors have lots of megapixels, and as a result, they expose the optical problems more than ever before of shooting underwater, particularly shooting wide angle. And they're the most demanding of using the right equipment, using the right configurations and the right settings to get the most out of those high quality sensors. But whatever camera you use, the physics and the lessons are, are really the same for everyone. So I hope everyone can get something from this talk. Also important to begin with, to remind you all that this talk is very much about image quality, not quality imagery, as, as it were. Um, normally I talk about how you can get better photos by better photographic techniques. This is very much a technical talk aim, aimed at getting an understanding your dome port using water contact optics, neither of which will make you a better photographer, but they do have the possibility with very little effort on your part once you've understood things to improve the quality of every wide angle picture you take. Or I guess to look at it the other way, if you fail to appreciate the lessons, then you're throwing away a ton of image quality that you've paid for in your very expensive camera in every frame that you take. I've tried to keep this presentation equation free and I'll try and use plain language rather than technical terms wherever I can. It's really aimed this talk to help keen photographers understand underwater optics and the strengths and weaknesses of their system. I really want you to understand what settings will maximize your image quality with your system and what are the penalties for straying away from them. I also hope it will help you understand what you're getting if you choose to invest your, your hard-earned money in a larger dome port or a water contact lens or port. And answer that question that everyone always asks me is whether you specifically need to get one yourself.
I'm going to show some data and some graphs. Um, and I think they're actually really interesting because they, they, they reveal in, in numbers what a lot of them for, for many years, underwater photographers have said to each other about the way they feel dome ports work and the problems they have. I think the best place to start understanding underwater optics is actually back in the olden days, back before photographers had dome ports. It's actually very easy to see why everyone wanted some solution for the problems they were having. This is a, a Rolly Marine housing developed by, by the camera, German camera company Rolly and Hans Haas and represents sort of totally state of the art underwater camera from the 1950s. I guess since the time of, of Louis Vuitton and William Thompson, which was, was 100 years or Thompson was 100 years before Haas, underwater cameras all used a standard window or porthole, as they called it, um, to shoot through. Um, by the way, that's why ports are called ports. It's simply just short for porthole. However, flat ports create some serious optical issues in water caused by the bending of light, which is technically called refraction. Um, as with almost all optical problems underwater, the issue actually isn't really the port itself, but the big change that the light experiences crossing between those two very different mediums, the water outside the housing and the air inside it. The easier we make that transition to light by basically making more and more advanced boundaries, um, the better our lens behind that will work. The flat boundary created by a flat port is probably as bad a boundary as you could have, although it's the simplest to make. When a light ray hits that at any sort of angle, it bends and that bending causes a host of issues. The exception to that, which I should mention, is that when light hits that boundary straight on, i.e. you're shooting absolutely dead ahead through a flat port, it passes through absolutely fine. And we'll come back to why that's valuable in, in a little bit. Anyway, this bending of light when it transitions through a flat port from air into water, water into air, whichever way you're sort of visualising the, the light looking out or, or the light coming in. The most noticeable thing that we see is that a flat port restricts the angle of view of a lens by a lot by about 33%. That's a really big change in the angular view. We don't tend to see that underwater because we obviously put our camera in our housing, take the housing underwater and only then look through the viewfinder and see that change in angle. So we don't actually see it because we just get used to what our lenses see, but it makes a really big difference. And I've actually got some really, really nice test shots from, from, from Edward that show this problem clearly. This is a shot, test shot of grid squares taken through a flat port. And this is the top half of the frame, which is in air. It's taken with a 24 mens, 24 mil lens and it shows exactly how things should be. And I'll bring up now the rest of the picture, which is where the, un, the, 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 second, the lower half of the split level. And it shows you what the same, this same port does underwater. And you can see a few things very immediately. First of all, the numbers and the squares are much larger in the underwater half, showing that magnification of the scene, that scene, that reduction in the angle of view of the lens, which if you want to shoot wide angle or water, underwater is very annoying. If I zoom in on one of the corners, you can really start to see some of the other problems. You can see, first of all, that the, the lines aren't straight, aren't horizontal. They're bending downwards. In this case, they're actually curving downwards and they curve increasingly more towards the corners, the wider the lens sees. So the wider the lens you use behind a flat port, the worse and worse the problems you see. Also, the grid lines themselves are actually becoming increasingly blurred, particularly if you look at the vertical grid lines, increasingly blurred towards the corner of the, of the field. And really, that's one of the key messages with a, about refraction is refraction is bad and it gets worse and worse the wider out, the more angle you try and see out through the port. I think for me, the message from this is flat ports aren't ideal, especially away from that sort of straight ahead view. And the wider the lens we use, and, and remember, these aren't taken with a particularly wide angle lens, the more of these corner problems we'll see, which is why in practice these days we only use flat ports with macro lenses. And it's why in the olden days everyone was desperate to have some solution that wasn't a flat port. Even so, I think one of the main issues that we get from the bending of light is that when you bend a light ray, it splinters into the different colours of the rainbow. And even if you're sort of relatively new to underwater, photog underwater photography, you'll almost certainly heard photographers talking about chromatic aberration or, or CA, it's often shortened to. And you'll have probably even seen there's a box actually in Lightroom under lens corrections that says remove chromatic aberration. So this isn't just an underwater thing, but it's basically caused by imperfect optics, 
the boundaries within those splinter light rays into different colours. And that creates a phenomenon that we most clearly see in our pictures as kind of colourful fringing around what should be a sharp point of detail has actually got colourful fringes on either side. We can actually see chromatic aberration happening naturally underwater. It's nothing to do with photography, but it's an, ex it's an interesting example of exactly the same thing. We often catch this in our, in, in our pictures, or if you look carefully when you're underwater, you can see it happening. When the surface of the ocean is really calm, it, the ocean acts a bit like a lens and it focuses the sunlight into sharp lines of, of light on the seabed. And if you look closely at those lines, and I've chosen a bit that's particularly spread out here, the main one, but if you look at the one towards the top of the frame, it's a bit more normal. But you can see on either side of that, that sharp point of light, you've got fringing, purple fringing on one side, orangey red fringing on the other side. And this is nothing to do with photographic optics, but it's exactly the same process of, of chromatic aberration, in this case being caused by the light passing from the air to water boundary at the surface of the ocean. Chromatic aberration is worth a minute of consideration for us full frame photographers because you really can see it clearly when we shoot with, with macro lenses. And it's something just to be aware that it's there and maybe you want to do something about it, even if that's just remembering to correct it in Lightroom. This shot here is taken with a 60mm lens, which is very commonly used by Nikon shooters. It's a wideish macro lens and it definitely records chromatic aberration in every picture that, that I take with mine anyway. And I'm sure mine is the same as everyone's. You have to look for it to see it. You're not going to see it if you put the picture at this sort of screen resolution or um, social media resolution. But if you zoom into your pictures and look at them in detail, you'll, you'll see them. This is a picture of a veined octopus in a shell at night. If I zoom in in the middle of the frame, you can see that the detail is recorded really nice and crisp and sharp. Lovely sharpness zoomed in on the middle of the frame. But if I zoom in on the corner of the frame to the same magnification where the picture is also in focus, um, you'll see that actually right, particularly right into the corner of the frame at the bottom left hand corner of the screen there, you'll see that the detail is really starting to blur away. And a lot of this is being caused by, by chromatic aberration. If I zoom in further on that, actually there's a white speck you can see just a bit in from the corner there. You can see that that white speck isn't actually recorded by the camera at all as a white speck anymore. You can see it's actually been splintered, uh, or the light's been splintered into this rainbow um, caused by chromatic aberration. Now, um, software can clear a lot of this up and actually some of the best wet close-up lenses, macro lenses, are actually designed to overcome this problem as well now. But generally, we just ignore this because the biz, the audience that looks at our pictures don't really care what the corners of our frame looks like. They're all busy looking at the octopus. Um, and anyway, the software does a pretty good job of minimising how this looks in our picture. But it's important to remember that this chromatic aberration doesn't just go away the moment we, we put a macro lens on. Anyway. Part of the reason for showing that was to stress that flat ports do have really big problems. Not in the middle of the frame where generally everything works nice and well, but in the corners where the light is trying to go through that boundary at more of an angle, which accentuates all the problems of, of a flat port um, that we've already talked about. So wouldn't it be great if we could have a port that wasn't flat, but instead was always angled at the angle that the lens was trying to look out at? it was kind of wrapped around the lens. So there would be no refraction, no bending of light at that boundary anywhere. And that is exactly what we get in a dome port when it's correctly set up. Dome ports work because when they're correctly positioned, they allow the light to pass through perpendicular to the boundary in, at 90 degrees, straight onto the boundary. And therefore in, avoid all the problems of, rea of refraction in, in one fell swoop. Because there's no bending of light, there's, there's really none of the, none of the problems that we, we're used to associating um, with them. It's good to look at a little bit of history at this point. The first recorded use of a simple dome port is attributed actually to the, the French Navy in the 1930s. But it wasn't until the 1960s that scuba diving photographers started using them. And two American photographers are, are sort of widely attributed with coming up with dome ports at pretty much the same time. One is Flip Schulke and the other is Walt Stark. At the time, it was really hard to find domes, so they both used the domed acrylic from boat compasses as their domes. The photo on the left here shows um, Schulke's housing, and the one on the right is one of Stark's photos from 1965, which also, I, I, one of the reasons I wanted to show this shot, is it also shows us what Caribbean reefs are supposed to look like and what they look like before we gave 
um, Coral's white band disease in the, the early 19, at the very beginning of the 1980s, which really wiped out these species and totally changed the look of Caribbean reefs forevermore. That, that picture there is in, in Andros, and the shallows around Andros don't, don't look like that, sadly, anymore. Anyway, for completeness, I should add that actually in those days, the world of underwater photography was not joined up and, and all communicating like it is these days. And it was highly likely that photographers from other countries, and I've heard several tell me that they were independently using dome ports around this time as well, and I never heard of Schulke and Stark. But for me, it was both Flip Schulke and, and Walt Stark that really were the two that shared this idea by writing about it. And for me, that's why they should, should get the credit for, for starting dome ports. Anyway, while domes are a brilliant and elegant solution, they do create one big optical problem, and that is that they create a curved field, which is a little bit hard to get ahead around, um, but I'll try and explain in the next few slides. Domes, when they're immersed in water, act like a negative lens in front of the camera. And the more curved the dome port is, the stronger this le negative lens effect is. This graphic um, here shows tries to show a little bit how it works. So the straight blue arrow on the right is our subject. But because the, of the lens effect of the dome once it's in water, the dome creates a virtual image of the subject that the lens inside the housing must focus on. Um, and that virtual image is shown by the, the blue, bended blue line in the, in the sort of centre of the, of the slide here. And the things to remember about that is, first of all, that that line, that, that virtual image is much closer to the dome and secondly, that it bends, and it bends in parallel with the, the shape of the dome. And this is actually one of the reasons why the bigger the dome port, the, the better, because the, the, the smaller the dome, the more tightly and the closer this virtual image is. But we'll come back to that in a little bit. Anyway, this problem of, of curved field is such a problem because camera lenses are designed to, to focus on a flat plane, the black line I've put onto the graph now. So the upshot of this is it's very easy when you shoot with a dome port to get the centre of the picture in focus. But if you use a very narrow depth of field when you shoot with a dome port, the edges of your picture will be completely blurred because the virtual image is curving away from that plane of focus. And that's why when we shoot with dome ports, if we have that problem of blurriness increasing towards the corners. I took this picture to show this. The photo on the left is the whole picture. The picture on the right is the bottom left hand corner of the frame. And what you can see in it is that it, the blur increases into the corner of the frame. And this is simply because of that curvature of the virtual image. So even if you're not quite understanding the optics, you should hopefully be able to see the effect of it here. But to quantify this, Edward ran some simulations through his lens designing software of an underwater lens behind a dome port. And it was really interesting to, to look in detail at how the different light paths through that dome port and then on through the lens were affected by, by this phenomenon. I'm not going to bore you with all the details of exactly what this is all doing, but I'm going to show you some of the, the resulting data from it. And I've plotted that data up on this graph here. The first simulation we ran was the, the dome port and the lens in air. So the dome doesn't really have a big effect on image quality. And this graph here shows on the, the vertical axis, the lower the line is on this graph, the better the image quality. The higher the line, the more problems we're having, the, the worse the image quality is. So in air, the green line that I've put on the graph has pretty good image quality right across the frame. And the, the X axis, the horizontal axis, shows the image quality from the center of the frame on the left to the edge of the frame, the corners of the frame on the right. And you can see that in air, the, the, the lens um, and the port all work pretty nicely and we have pretty good image quality across the board. I'm now going to add the data from a test with the, the same lens and dome port, but now with water in front of the dome port. And what we see is that problem. As the lens is now put in water, as the dome port, sorry, is in put in water. So the image quality remains good in the center of the frame, but as we get further and further away from the, the center of the frame, as the lens is seen wider and wider, so the image quality falls away. And just for fun, here's the flat port, which is obviously good in the center of the frame, but very quickly goes off the scale, goes way off the scale. I can't plot any more data because the other data points were just, they, they didn't give any, any usable results. Fortunately though, we do have an easy fix for this problem of corner blurring caused by dome ports underwater. And that is, we close the aperture to give our, our camera more depth of field. And that depth of field is enough then to encompass all of that curved virtual image and bring the whole picture into focus. 
Um, here, are some, here are those test shots again. And if I close the aperture down to f20, you'll see that straight away all that corner detail is now within the range of, of the depth of field. And I can bring all that detail back so I can get all my detail back. So the big weakness of domes is actually fairly easy to mitigate. The solution is simply to keep the aperture reasonably closed and allow the depth of field to overcome that curvature. So the question that follows from that is, is pretty obviously how close do we have to keep it? And that really depends on between sort of two and five or six factors. The one I want to focus on first is the most important, and that is sensor size. The bigger your image sensor, the more you need to stop down your lens for sharpness right into the corners of the frame. I've, I've put up on the screen there, I'm sure you've all been looking at them, the starting sort of my, my jump settings for all the different camera formats. So on full frame cameras, my jump settings are f13, f14. On crop sensor cameras, DX, APS-C cameras, um, the, so that's one and a half times crop cameras, you want to be f8, f11. Um, on micro four thirds cameras, two times crops cameras, you can probably get away with being f6.7 to f11. And there's quite a bit of range on those ones, really because of some of the other factors, particularly dome port size, which I'll come on and talk about in a few slides time. I look, if I look through my data in Lightroom from my wide angle lenses, from my fisheye lenses, if I look through it, 90% of my full frame wide angle shots are shot on f13, f14. And I always, always, always just check my camera before I jump in and I jump in with my aperture set on f13 and I move it surprisingly little while I'm shooting. I also know if I jump in at f13 and my ISO is at 320 and my strobes are on quarter power each um, on my main strobes, I know that will give me a pretty damn good shot straight out of the bag. Anyway, closing the aperture to, to these values doesn't take any skill. It just takes a bit of photographic underwater photography knowledge. And it's something that, as I was saying, you can do before you jump in the water. But if we don't do it, we end up taking pictures with blurred corners and there's really no need to have done so. Um, this is a beautiful picture taken by Timothy Allen, who's an amazing photographer who was commissioned by the BBC to shoot stills alongside their big blue chip documentary series, Human Planet, is one of the, the stills. This photo has beautiful light. It captures an incredible moment and gesture from the, the, the free diver with this, this school of fish. But it does have very blurred corners. And this has nothing to do with, you know, with, with the photographer's photographic eye or talent or anything like that. It was, you know, the blurred corners come from a decision that could have been made when loading the camera into the housing and not under pressure of the moment underwater. And it wouldn't have changed this shot in any way. It would have just improved the image quality. This shot was probably shot at f8. Um, and if it had been just shot at f13, those corners would have been sharp. Closing the aperture for corner sharpness does make a few things harder. It's hard to get enough strobe light onto big scenes or big animals. And full frame shooters might want to invest in powerful strobes or routinely work at slightly higher ISOs to really help light up these scenes with the aperture that little bit more closed. Also, closing the aperture is a big problem when shooting available light scenes in dark places. Um, you really want to be at that F13, F14 for that perfect corner sharpness, but you also need a reasonably fast shutter speed because you haven't got any strobes to freeze the action. And you don't want the ISO to be too sky high to give you the best image quality. And it, it can require a careful balancing of those three factors to really get the most image quality out of the out of such scenes in these conditions. The other big factor that plays an important role in corner sharpness is dome port size. And big, big, big domes are best in this regard. The smaller the dome, the more you need to stop the lens down. And that doesn't come without some negatives, particularly with the higher resolution full frame cameras these days. Um, you, you know, once you start getting up to F18, F20, F22, you are going to be throwing away some of that resolution to, to diffraction, which is a, a photographic effect, which I'm not going to get too into. And so it's actually one of the other reasons why a big dome port allows you to shoot just, you know, those slightly more sweet spot apertures. If you go and shoot full frame camera with a small dome port, you're either going to have blurry corners or you're going to lose some of your resolution to diffraction. So it's important to invest as a full frame shooter in those big domes. And actually, in those, in those early days of underwater photography, all the dome ports were tiny. And the one thing that the photographers in that era really lusted after were the big domes, which are really hard to make. And obviously, we're very lucky these days that we have a really, really wide choice of domes to shoot. That's actually the the camera that I used to shoot the, the, the Iceland picture that's taken on this. There's a picture of it on the same day sitting on the ice there. 
The reason that dome port size matters is that the bigger the dome port, the further away and the less curved that virtual image is. This graph, which you don't need to pay much attention to, I just I have it, so I thought I'd, uh, I, I'd show it. It's an old graph made in the 70s. And it just shows the relationship between the size of the dome from a big dome at the top to a small dome at the bottom. And the distance the virtual image is away from the camera. Um, and you can see it's a fairly simple relationship between the two. These are measured data. The take home message that as a photographer, you really know, you need to know from all this is small domes um, are problematic, particularly on full frame cameras. And they require us to keep the aperture really closed if we want those corners to be sharp. We only want to use them with full frame cameras if we don't care about corner sharpness or we're, we're in an extreme, we want the extreme advantages that a small dome might give us. And using Edward's simulation data that I showed before, um, if you, you remember it, this, this graph shows the higher the lines on this graph, the worse the image quality. And the, the horizontal axis shows you the image quality from the center of the lens to the corners of the picture. I'm now going to throw up some different dome port size. The original test was with a 200 millimeter or eight inch dome. These tests are all done with the aperture open, by the way, to show these problems. And I'm now going to add some data from 150 mil and 100 mil domes. So that's six and four inch domes. And you can see that they're fairly similar to the 200 mil dome, but they definitely get considerably worse in the corners. I think what's quite interesting about these data is they're actually in Edwards tests, which is based on a theoretical lens. The two of them actually perform very similarly. I would say certainly using a fisheye lens, I find a 150 mil dome on full frame is really quite a lot better in terms of corner sharpness than a 100 mil dome on full frame. I generally should shoot a 150 mil dome on say f14 and i probably wouldn't venture much below f20 on 100 mil dome on, on full frame to get really acceptable corner sharpness now i'm going to add data to the graph the orange line here which is data from a 230 mil or nine inch dome the size of dome that a lot of photographers use on full frame cameras and you can see that this offers quite a significant advantage towards the edges of the frame i know that these domes are an expensive purchase but hopefully this this data helps you see what it's giving you I think a smaller factor that still makes a noticeable difference is the subject matter that you're shooting. A large animal in the blue is way more forgiving a scene to shoot than shooting reef scenery with detail right into the corners of a frame. So for a shot like this, I definitely feel confidence dropping down to f11 on my full frame camera, knowing that I'd still be nice and sharp around the wingtips of the animal. But maybe the blue water isn't perfect right to the corners, but blue water is blue water. But if I'm on the reef, I really want to be f13, f14. Another major factor that most photographers underappreciate the importance of is the exact positioning of the dome. It's really important to use the correct port extension to get the most quality out of the, the dome. And I'm going to bring up the graph again that we've been adding lines to. I'm going to add one final line to this. I'm going to take the best dome, the 230 dome, and put it on the wrong port extension and add that data now. And you can see that, that the, the big expensive 230 dome on the wrong port extension has given really, really poor performance in the corners. So, you know, just be aware that, yes, you've bought the expensive dome, but you do need to invest on having the right port extension to really maximize the image quality from it. The two factors I want to mention quickly before finishing this talk are that lenses make a small difference. Fish eyes are definitely a bit more forgiving than normal lenses, but it's not that, that big a deal. Certainly when I shoot with a rectilinear lens like this picture here, I definitely want to use the biggest dome I've got with me and I want to definitely make sure I'm using the correct port extension and I'm going to be really careful with my apertures. I'm still doing all that with a fish eye, but I need to be maybe slightly less careful. I can push, I can bend a few rules every now and again if I need to. Um, another minor factor is diopters. Um, a number of people like to screw diopters to the front of their lens when shooting with a dome port and they can make a di difference with a rectilinear lens sometimes. I think first they're essential on some of the older lenses that do not focus close enough to bring that virtual image into focus, especially so with smaller domes and actually why in the old days of underwater photography when lenses didn't focus very closely and dome ports were smaller, they were absolutely essential to use. But as dome ports got bigger and lenses were able to focus closer, there's been less of a need to, to, to use them. 
one of the downsides of using diopters is they, they, they reduce the angle of coverage of the lens a little bit, which actually often helps to improve the corners because just by in, it, you're not now seeing the widest extremes. But this is kind of counterproductive to using a wide angle lens in the first place. I used to quite often use diopters when I used, um, had some smaller domes. This Silky Shark in the Bahamas was shot with a, a Nikon 1735 and a 180mm and dome. But I, I don't tend to use them these days since switching over to 230 domes. Finally, to complete this section of talk, I just want to mention a couple of factors that don't really make a big difference, despite what you might be told when you're buying them in, in shops. First of all, glass versus plastic domes don't really make a big difference to image quality, in my experience, as long as both are in good condition. And actually, the difference in price is, is really more to do with their lastingness than their optical qualities. The other thing that, again, a lot of man, a lot of camera camera dealers won't want you to believe is that housing brand makes very little difference in fact the glass domes that most of the housing manufacturers sell all come from the same glass factory that said the advice that the different housing companies give you on port extension does vary and the quality of this advice really does make a really big difference to how well their ports will work and i think i'd always look for a company that offers the right port extensions not just port extensions to convenient round numbers the round number isn't always the, the right port extension. That wraps up the, the first part of the talk. And in the second part, I'm going to go on and look in detail at water contact optics.